moment, but uh, this is the second meeting uh, for the month of June. Thank you all for making the time to attend our fellowship tonight. Uh, we have a very interesting guest speaker. His name is Dr. Chris Hart. He writes for the Daily Nation, uh, the, the, the Sunday Nation, sorry. Uh, and he will be with us shortly. So uh, we can kick off the meeting with uh, Liz taking us through the grace, which is Elizabeth. Uh, I'll do the loyal toast and uh, Rotarian Keshi will take us through the four-way test in that order. So over to you, Liz. Okay. Uh, Rotary Grace, O oh God and give of all good, we thank thee for our daily food. May Rotary friends and Rotary ways help us serve thee all our days. Amen. 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 Uh, hand over heart or charge your glasses because you are in your houses. Uh, hand over heart. A toast to the President of the Republic of Kenya. To the President. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Keshi, take us through the four-way test. Uh, the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any visiting Rotarians, uh, stroke Rotaractors, kindly put your club, your club's details, your name and your club's details on the chat uh, part of this uh, call. Then we will, we will, we will toast to your club at the end of the of, of the fellowship. Uh, I'm seeing quite a number of uh, different different clubs represented here. So Asante Nisana, thank you very much for attending our fellowship. Uh, we will allow maybe ten minutes for visiting Rotarians to tell us your name and the club that you belong to. So I think we can uh, moderate that. I, uh, kindly, if you just put in uh, your names as they are, just maybe two names, so that I can be able to identify who is a member of Madaraka and who is a visiting uh, Rotarian, so that we can have a part for just a brief introduction. Maybe we, uh, the ones who are just see randomly. Uh, we have someone called Caroline Makewa. Car uh, hey, everyone. Hi. Oh, hi. My my name is Koki Caroline from the Russia Club of Nairobi Central. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alicia. Okay, Alicia is not online. Uh, B. Matego. Hi, I'm, I'm a visitor, I'm a guest. I got an invitation from somebody else, a friend who is uh, from the Rotaract, I think Mutaiga. Okay. So I'm not a Rotarian, I'm a visitor, yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Uh, who else, mm -hmm. Beth Mbene? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> This is Rotary and Beth Bene from Rotary Club of Nairobi Industrial Area. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
we saw your paper we saw your president on the paper <laughs> congratulations to you uh isabella camera um good evening everyone my name is isabella camera uh, the immediate past president of of uh, Rotary Club of Karura, and I'm glad to join you. Thank you. Thank you, Sana. Uh, Innocent? Uh, good evening, family and friends of Rotary. Evening. Innocent, Innocent Ouko from the Great Rotary Club of you and Afia. Happy to be here. Thank you. Um, who else? Ngina Lioness. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ngina Muteti from Russia Club of Karura. It's uh, an honor to be here. Thank you. Hey, we have Wenli Kion. <laughs> Um, Madam President, uh, this is Alexandra from Rotary Club of Langata. Uh, Wendley is my guest. We used to work with her in Kenya. And uh, she is now in Kazakhstan, actually, and dialing into the Rotary meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. It was, oh, I, you Hello, know, everyone. <laughs> this is Wendy. Thanks for Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Wendy. <laughs> Thank you, you. Um... Who else need, wants to be introduced? Who wants to introduce themselves? Uh, Carol Olby. Thank you very much, Madam President. Caroline Olbara from mm -hmm. Rotary Club of Langata, and I'm very happy to join you as always. Karibu uh, sana. Catherine Mwema. Hi, kids. <laughs> I think Catherine Mama is not audible. Um, Joy Anindo. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, I'm Catherine Mama, a former Rotaractor, Nairobi Club, Rotaract Club of Nairobi Central. I wasn't expecting this, so I was going to be better. Hello, Sana Kids. Uh, well, well, well. Yes, Joy. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is uh, Joy Anindo. I was. Uh, I think this is my first ever. Allah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Joy. Somebody else is yes. sick. No, no, no. <laughs> I Joy. said I was. A, yeah, I was a doctor actor back in um, Moy University many years ago. But I'm a friend of Rotary and I've been invited as a guest by Keshi. Okay, Thank Karibu you. I'm glad to be here. Okay, Karibu. Uh, Lamek. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Lamek uh, from the Rotary Club of Kenyatta University. I'm the president elect and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Karibusana, Mr. P. Noel Kitonga. Noel? Uh, good evening. Evening uh, to you. Rotary Club of Rongai. Glad to be here. Santi Sana. Uh, yeah. Uh, I do believe, I think we have captured almost everyone, right? Anyone else who yes, feels like uh, Tumara Tupa? Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, my fellow Rotarians and friends. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ruth Kinyanjui, a past president of Rotary Club of Hullingham. I'm really glad to have joined you tonight. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, good evening. My name is Wedgate Samson Boy um, from Rotary Club of Langata. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. 
Anyone else? Um, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I think I think I missed my slot to introduce myself. I'm Rosiana Madara from Rotary Club of Lanata. Karibu sana. Karibu sana for our fellowship. Uh, anyone else? Madam President, may I? Yes, please. Um, Lydia Ndirangu, I am a guest. I'm glad to join today. Karibu sana, Karibu sana, Lydia. Nice to see you again. Um, someone called uh, Nick, Nick Kamara. Yes, uh, good evening, President, uh, fellow Rotarians and guests. My name is Nick Kamere, past president of Rotary Club of Karura, and I'm um, happy to be here. Okay. Uh, AG, Joe, tell us something. <laughs> hello, uh, hello, Madaraka. Nairobi Madaraka. The name is uh, Assistant Governor John Wamanya from the Rotary Club of Kampala Metro. Coming to see if Austin and Eric finally made it to Zoom. Uh, <laughs> to sadly, to sadly, I think you'll be disappointed. <laughs> I hope you didn't put a bet. You may just be disappointed. Anyone else? I'd like to kick off this meeting uh, by thanking you all for taking the time to join us uh, for this fellowship. So our guest speaker is also in with us and I will ask Rotarian IPP Sun P. Henry Durango to introduce our speaker for the day. Good, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I have the distinct honor of introducing a man that we probably all know or know of. Chris Hart was born and educated in England, where after a career in industry, he, re he retrained during midlife as a psychologist. Initially, he worked in the area of trauma, for example, with crime victims, people recovering from serious illnesses, and also with adults having learning difficulties before specializing in relationships and social skills. He is a well-known columnist in the Sunday Nation and the Sunday Standard. He also writes for other publications. Four of his books are available on Amazon. After working for more than 20 years in Nairobi, he now offers counseling, coaching, and workshops online covering all aspects of relationships, both within the family and work environments. For example, dating, marriage, family conflict, motivation, uh, sorry, covering all aspects of relationships within family and work environments. For example, dating, marriage, family conflict, motivation, and work life balance, together with all related issues such as anxiety and social skills. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly join me in welcoming Chris Hart to speak to us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you. Over to you, Dr. Hart. Am I audible to you guys? Yes. Okay, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. That's great. Um, if it's okay with you, I, I'm not sure how long you want to have this particular part of the session tonight. So what I thought I'd do is I'd speak for a few minutes, really just to break the ice, introduce a couple of topics, and then hopefully you'll start to get, I don't know, uh, <laughs> a little bit uh, wild and ask questions and disagree with me and generally make a big fuss. Does that sound like a good <laughs> idea? That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the topics I had in my mind were things that are going on as a result of the 
coronavirus, the, the lockdowns and curfews, um, they've led to some changes in the way people are dating and the way people are conducting their relationships, which are, I suspect, likely to stick. I think they'll become a part of our lives after the whole thing's ended. Um, the first of those is the way in which people are dating. Quite obviously, people are dating online. It's much harder for people to go and meet face to face, indeed not allowed in lots of countries at the moment. And so people have really taken to the internet to try and find partners. But the interesting part of that, apart from the fact that the dating sites have all made it very clear that they've had an enormous increase in business during the lockdowns. But what's really happened is that people are dating in a different way. Um, the traditional online way of dating was to mess around with quite meaningless messages for ages and ages and ages. And quite frankly, people were behaving quite badly online, uh, leading each other on and not frankly getting to grips with a proper relationship before they would then meet in the, in the flesh, so to speak. And then to be honest, there was quite a heavy hookup culture involved. People were really looking for very casual relationships and they weren't treating their people, weren't treating each other very well. But what's happened now is that almost immediately people make contact online, they move to video and they start having face-to-face -face online conversations and all of a sudden the connections start to get much deeper people treat each other much more kindly they're much nicer to one another they form a real connection and they get to know each other really quite well long before there's any possibility of meeting and they let their guard down quite a bit uh, people, for example, cheerfully have a video conference, con what's the right word, conversation, uh, but they're sitting in their bedrooms and they're probably not dressed particularly um, formally and so on. I think you can visualise what's going on and the whole thing becomes online intimate quite quickly, especially emotionally intimate. And I have a feeling that that is a feature of online dating that's going to stick. People aren't going to do the casual messaging culture in the future. Uh, they're going to go quickly to video and they're quickly going to let their guard down with the people they like. And they're going to get to know each other quite deeply before they actually meet face to face. So that sounds to me like a really good change and as i say one that i think is going to stick the other thing that of course has happened is that people are successfully working from home and the fact that they're working from home successfully has changed people's expectations of work-life balance particularly for working couples working couples with children and the fact that they've been successful working from home, has made them change their expectations. And it's also changed the expectations of their employers. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is that a lot of employers have suddenly realized that productivity is just as good, and that a mix of meeting in the face-to-face -face and online is going to work. And they're all these organizations beginning to think that this might enable them to move to cheaper offices and have lower costs for their offices generally. And so the organizations are enthusiastic about working from home, just as the participants are. And of course, from the view of the couple, there are huge advantages. Picture a setup where effectively one of the couple can be at home all the time and while the other one's away working. That means in effect that they are able to supervise their children the whole time. So their childcare arrangements change dramatically. And I think that the impact of that on the way couples design their careers is going to be quite profound. 
Women in particular, for example, have delayed marriage because they recognize that the moment they have a family, they drop out of the promotion race. But that needn't happen in future. They could easily start to have their children earlier at what you might call more traditional times. And in effect, you'll expect their husbands to take greater, a greater role in the rearing of their children. Now, the interesting part about this is that I think that husbands are actually finding that this is quite attractive. They're enjoying doing it. And so I think this is, again, something that's going to stick, that working arrangements look likely to get far more flexible in ways that are going to be very helpful to dual income couples with children. And the fact that it's advantageous for a lot of organizations actually drives the whole process. So I think those two things are aspects of the, the lockdown, the, the curfew that is going to change and stay. So I don't know what your thoughts are. Does that sound to you like I'm right, that it is going to stick? Does it, that sound from your perspective as if it's a good change or a bad change? How does that all strike you? It's, it's a change. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, the a best. change. <laughs> it's just a change. <laughs> Has anybody got any thoughts about it? I mean, do they like the idea? Can any of do yes. any can the husbands tell us it? whether they like it? <laughs> Husbands, <laughs> husband Josh. The host has refused for us to <laughs> unmute ourselves. <laughs> well, I well I think we we already take the rules. So the changes, honestly, for the old timers, I'm not seeing it being a big difference. Maybe for guys who are coming in in the dating scene now looking for partners. But people who are already settled, I'm not too sure. I think the biggest impact, if I, if you can hear me, I think the biggest impact is going to be on young families. That's for sure. Couples who are just thinking about having children or have, have recently had children, they're going to have a big, see some big changes, I think. Um, and I think that couples will need to think about what that means in terms of how do you encourage husbands to take more part in rearing children, for example. And if anybody has any doubts on that issue, I'll happily expound on it. No, just proceed. We can, we can ask at the end. <laughs> okay. Um, well, for example, um, a lot of husbands are actually new, hus husbands of new children, when a child is born, are actually quite keen to take part. They enjoy it. They discover if they get involved in childcare very early on, they, they actually find that they're getting a great deal of pleasure out of it. The problem is that there are some deep-seated roles that people slip into quite easily, like, for example, young mothers have a tendency to be very controlling in a household. So the baby will be brought up according to her rules. And so for example, a husband who starts to try and feed a baby and it isn't quite how she likes to see it done, you'll get a barrage of criticism. Uh, or he'll do some task like, I don't know, make a bed or something, and then she'll promptly redo it because it doesn't meet her standards. And I think you can imagine that that's extremely off-putting. So most husbands who experience that give up pretty quickly and drop away from taking part in, in, in childcare and, and household chores. So one of the things that I think women are going to have to ask themselves is whether they can let go of that controlling attitude towards child rearing and be more accepting of the different ways in which men rear their children as opposed to women i mean men for example tend to be well they tend to be much firmer but they also tend to be much more rough and tumble and they tend to be more relaxed about 
the things that children have to do, like be fed. They are they are much more relaxed about meal times and the way meals are, are done and stuff like that compared to their wives. And there's nothing wrong with that ultimately. So I think that's another thing that is probably going to change as a result of all of this. Households where the husband spends more time working from home are going to challenge the old role, the male female roles. How do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll gather that I'm quite optimistic, in other words, that I think we're going to see some positive changes out of the things that people have had to adapt to in lockdowns and curfews. You are extremely optimistic. <laughs> well, feel free to disagree. If, um, if you think I'm way, way over the, the top in optimism, well, say so, do, please. No, 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 no. Uh... I think also people might miss their the 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 traditional and I'm using traditional in big quotes, eh? uh, mm -hmm. the traditional way of how things were before uh, the curfew, where perhaps uh, the 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 father was not getting to come home maybe before. Uh, sometime before nine let's say for example yeah. before nine leaving uh the mother running the household maybe taking care of the babies doing homework whatever then the guy comes in at at nine giving that means that it's like both of them have their own their own space per yes. se. so they're not tripping over each other in the in the home when you don't see each other that means you don't see each other critically and uh, which brings i think maybe some conflicts that have been there in the home uh, that are maybe more than more than what was there in such a scenario uh especially this time of the the lockdown domestic violence also has begun because well they're around each other. Yes. Um, I've been very interested in the way that people have responded to all the messages they've been getting from governments. And I think one of the things they've... You'd almost say that governments have overdone it a little bit. People are rather afraid of public places. And... This may not have taken root yet completely in Nairobi because the numbers of people infected is still relatively low, but in parts of the world where infection rates have been higher, people are less willing to spend time in crowded places. Uh, they're less willing to socialize in public places. They're, in effect, they're spending more time at home. And the curious thing is that they're getting to like it they're beginning to find that they like doing the things in a more relaxed atmosphere, spending more time at home, uh, keeping in touch with their friends through this sort of arrangement, uh, video and what have you, and spending, to bluntly, they're spending less time in bars. In lots of countries, of course, the bars aren't even open again yet. So, there's a, there's a distinct change in what people's expectations are going to be, I think. And I think we'll see couples spending more time together. And yes, you're right, they may have to learn to manage conflict better. They may have to learn to manage each other's time better. And uh, be nicer to one another <laughs> as a result of that. Any comments from anyone? Yes, uh, you mentioned the change in roles, male-female roles, and I would yes. agree with you, because if we are both working from home, 
and I'm busy at work and you, the husband needs a cup of tea or needs something, I mean, some service from me, then he'll respect the fact that yes, I am working and he'll go into the kitchen and make himself a meal or a cup of tea or take care of the children. So yes, this uh, Corona arrangement is going to, I agree with you, it's going to change roles within the family or we'll have to work together and learn to yeah, work better together or live better together. Yes, I think you're right. Um, I do emphasize though that women are going to have to relax their control on the way the household runs. Um, the traditional female role includes making a lot of decisions uh, with, on the way the house is run. For example, the brand of sugar you buy or the way a meal is cooked or presented or the way the children are dressed or, or any of those sorts of things. I think if women would like their husbands to take a bigger part in all of that, they're going to have to relax some of that control and live with some of the choices that their husbands make, which will come easy to begin with, I suspect. <laughs> what do you think? There are quite a few thoughts here uh, on the on the chat. Uh, maybe you can allow me to read one or mm. two. Uh, <laughs> uh, when Li Kian mm, says, my experience is different. I was dreaming of working from home to spend more time with my child. However, when my son is at home, I found that it's not that easy to spend the whole day with him. He's an energetic boy. We only have one child, six years, but nobody's a company except us. Both my husband and I feel tired. <laughs> uh, yes, I've, I've heard similar stories. Um, I've also heard of lots of people being very successful in co-opting grandparents and so on into that sort of role. You know, just getting them to do some of the, of the child care to release parents to work from home. So I think people are beginning to address the problems. <laughs> Joy Anindo says, I think it's a great idea. Personally, I've enjoyed being close to my children while giving 100% at my job. But maybe it's because they're above 10 years old. I am unsure how to feel about toddlers. Well, Joy. <laughs> well. <laughs> Yes. I mean, we, we need to remember that as this whole situation unwinds, the kids, of course, will end up going back to school. And so some of the pressure on parents will diminish. Okay. Uh, Mark is asking, I think most will revert back to default settings when Corona is over. How long does it take for a society to adapt? or to change? Yes, it's a very interesting question that. I mean, you're right, maybe people will revert back to the old patterns. But I think there are some pressures that are going to um, encourage them to move in the directions I've mentioned. Like, for example, you take areas where uh, office rents and so on are astronomically high, you know, the, the New York's, London's, Nairobi's of the world. Um, if an organization can manage with half the size of office because it only has roughly half its workforce in the office at any given time, you can see that they're going to encourage people to work effectively from home to allow that to happen because it, the financial incentive is quite considerable. Um, there, there are people who are saying that they would like to work from home because it would allow them not to have to commute every day. If their commuting came down by 50%, like they were, one, one suggestion has been that half the team should be in on alternate weeks. So in other words, they commute in one week and they don't commute in the next. Well, now they start talking about possibly having a house in an area which is cheaper, uh, more attractive. Uh, so there's going to be a financial incentive and a lifestyle incentive for the participants themselves, the employees, as well as the organisations. So I suspect that there are going to be some pressures 
pushing people in the direction of being more flexible in let, let's just call it being more flexible in working arrangements not necessarily 100 percent working from home but more flexibility maybe maybe the the daily commute will spread out maybe people won't have to go in at particular times maybe people won't have to go in for days at a time i think flexibility is what's going to develop because of some financial incentives there's another oh, sorry uh there's another question to this mm -hmm. sorry just give me a second uh don't the rules also bring in power struggles since the conflicts you mean between the couple yes yes i i think that's true i think people have used their roles as part of the power struggle um single income families have always done that the guy who makes the money tends to insist on determining how it's spent uh, and the full-time housewife can get very very controlling about the way that the household is managed and you know the, the who controls the workers and all those sorts of things um i think that's going to have to change if this is going to work then people will have to search for more flexible roles as well um it may be that someone who's already been married for 25 years won't change but i suspect that people who are only just getting into marriage will change they will relish the new arrangements okay all right i'll give an opportunity to joy to possibly ask your your question the one that you've posted on the chat joy and Indo. okay um i guess my my comment came a little bit uh, late because i was typing very fast on my phone but it was about the issue of control the issue of um uh, women needing to be a little bit to relinquish their control a little bit more or maybe things that need to be bought or things like that maybe if um she's the one having to go to work maybe not working from home go to the office while the other partner works from home mm -hmm. so i was just saying that it, it has to be a conversation that has to be done beforehand because just because the other partner is now working from home does not mean that maybe they want that reverse change of roles or, or to be included in that maybe that aspect of the household and just expecting that since i'll be working from home that now i have say extra time to undertake uh, the household responsibilities that maybe the other partner was doing I think that is a recipe for conflict and I don't know how best maybe people can navigate that before um, it becomes a problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's very interesting. Um, like I say, I think people who've been carrying out the traditional roles for many, many years, the couple that's been married for a long time, they probably won't want to change very readily just like they don't like learning new skills and so on, as we, we all do this, don't we? we get older. But I suspect that younger people will want to change. I mean, you think about the classic couple that have lived separately before they marry. They've been independent and they've done their own thing in their own houses. And as they come together and they begin to cohabit and marry, I think there could be quite a lively debate as to how they conduct those new roles and i certainly think it's a topic that wants exploring as things settle as a couple settles in you know it's not a good thing to fall out over the way things are done years later it's better to anticipate the problems and talk about them and agree to be more flexible um, i think it's particularly noticeable that husbands who've never had a great deal of interaction with their children suddenly discover that they actually like it a lot more than they expect and so they will i suspect muscle in a little bit on what was the wife's traditional role and and she of course in return for giving up a little bit of control and letting him do that is going to be able to spend more time on her career and clearly that's going to be beneficial to both of them so I do think that there are, shall we say, pressures 
that are going to encourage people to move in a more flexible direction. Now, how successful they'll be, well, we'll see, won't we? <laughs> It's true. It remains to be seen. Uh, Stan, you have your hand up. Kindly ask a question. Stan? Hello. Hi. Uh, I thought I was to unmute my mic. <laughs> so, Dr. Chris. Hi there. Um, I've been wondering about this, the psychology behind women and workplaces and their husbands. You find that a woman would to respect their boss, their husband. I don't know if psychology behind that, even if, and when the husband is usually it's the same thing. A very interesting point you're making. Um, I think it's more general than that, you know. We are nicer to people outside of the relationship than we are to each other, if you think about it. We have a tendency to let slip. Uh, we take each other for granted more. We are not as polite. Um, we don't respond to what, what psychologists call bid for attention nearly so well as we do to someone like a boss or even a co-worker. Uh, and I think that's a natural feature of the way our mind works. It's not a good idea. In other words, I think people ought to give as much attention and be as polite to their spouses as they are to their co-workers and their bosses. It's just one of those things that builds up as people get into a marriage, and especially as the years go by. So my, my, my two penneth on this is that people should try and resist the tendency to do that, not by being ruder to their bosses, but by being nicer to their spouses. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, I hope uh, starting your question was answered. Uh, we will have Josh, yes. then Alex. All right, so sorry. Josh, then Alex. Uh, thanks, Dr. Hart. I, a point you raised earlier, I, I agree in terms of uh, the needs. The needs will start to change in terms of where you live, the neighborhood you live, particularly when you have to work from home. And mm -hmm. even from a HR perspective, employers might have to reconsider what good parks are. You know, the corner office, the the four-wheel yes. guzzler may not be the incentive a work from home, you know, a, you know, employee might consider a good pack. Probably consider, yes. you know, right now having a home office is actually a, a thinking it has become a priority to have extra room to set up a desk where I can work and feel comfortable yes. and I can, you know, be away from everyone else in the house for three, four hours before I yes. come back, you know, to, you know, when I'm having meetings and all that. So yes, I agree. Uh, traditional, you know, I may not need to go live in Siokimawe anymore. I might need to get that comfortable apartment or, or you know, a house with a compound somewhere in Lovington, you know, so that I'm, you know, I'm able to relax as I work. Yes. Yes, I think people are going to think like that. I think, of course, one of the things that people are really going to work towards is not having to get into their car every morning and get into that traffic and have the same wretched experience coming home every night. They're going to want to avoid the commute as much as possible. And they'll save some money by doing that. And so they're going to spend that money, I suspect, on doing just what you just said. They're going to choose a nicer apartment, or if they've got a nice place, they're going to be spend a bit of money on office furniture, things of that sort generally make their working environment as attractive as possible. Absolutely. Okay. Alex? Thank you, Madam President. Um, Chris, my question is to do with the office files and their role, as it were, in um, depressurizing, you know, relationships where you live with your alternate partner. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying that it applies to me necessarily. I'm asking for a friend. 
um, but what happens when you take out this this other party that you would go to for comfort, whether it was a full blown affair or just you know the person that you you get um, I guess intimacy without having to fight about children? How does that how does that now play that your only colleague that you've got who's working from the sofa while you work from the kitchen table is also your actual you know went to Sharia house or went to church spouse? Now, I'm not quite sure what your question is. Can you just be a little clearer? Are you talking about spouses here or are you talking about people who are an affair at work or what exactly are you saying? The, the, the office spouse. So it's, it's not someone you're married to, it's someone you have certain intimacies or you take right. your confidence in the office. Yes. Um, so this would be, I guess, lunches or coffee breaks or going to the water cooler together. Um, yes you know, in the office. Um, in some cases, it's a full-blown affair, but in some cases, it's just, you know, a, a platonic, very close relationship. Yes. So now that you're in the house with your actual spouse and you're not having this other separate time with this other individual, what do you think that's going to be the impact on the actual marriage? I mean, it's, I think it's interesting. Um, you're quite right. We do have office spouses. We do have favorite friends this colleagues don't we or otherwise and I suspect people are going to go to a lot of trouble to try and maintain them um, <laughs> to be like if that's going to be successful um, clearly the the office spouses are going to try and arrange to be in the office together and they're probably going to be a bit coy about their communications with each other when they're working from home. Um, they're, they're going to be a bit more discreet, I suspect, because they're that if there's quite obviously a very relaxed and enjoyable cross-gender conversation going on, the spouses at home, working at home, are going to get very, <laughs> let's say, upset about it. So, I think people are going to develop the office spouse relationship into something more discreet and more, um, shall we say, more open, more platonic. Dis I know discreet and open doesn't sound quite right, but you understand what I mean. It's going to be more something you can talk about. Uh, their feelings are not going to be expressed quite so e easily. They're going to be more thoughtful about how they express feelings for one another and how they organize the time they spend together. Okay, uh, Henry? Thank you, Madam President. Um, Dr. Hart, I'm thinking hi. about, hi, I'm thinking about um, divorce. It was a uh, concern. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a concern in the uh, past couple of years. And I'm wondering what happens now will, uh, with this new dynamic introduced into many relationships, uh, people spending perhaps more time than they have ever done before. How, what, what should we expect in a year's time? Um, Given Do you mean will there be more divorces, <laughs> or will will uh, there be a reduction? You know, you really asked a very subtle question there. Um, <laughs> some couples, I think, will learn a lot about each other in this whole spending more time working from home new future we've got. The, some couples will get more skillful at managing their relationship. For example, giving each other more space, giving each other more independence, and yet spending more time together. For example, they'll get better at being in the same room as one another, but not imposing on each other's activities. Couples like that, couples who make that transition and who get more skillful like I think the chances are that they will become better couple, better couples, happier, and much less likely to divorce. But you can also imagine couples where the exact opposite happens, where they don't develop those skills, they irritate the living daylights out of each other because they are spending so much more time with one another. 
I know couples who simply can't leave each other alone. In other words, they constantly impose on each other's space. And you can imagine that if they don't change that behavior, spending more time at home is going to be bad news for them, isn't it? So I think we'll see some couples getting more stable and much happier. And I think we'll also see some couples getting less stable and less happy. And where the balance will end up, whether we'll overall see more conflict in marriage or, or more divorce, I'm really not sure yet. Depends how skillfully people manage the transition. Thank you very much. Good okay. question, though. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Uh, I think we have sp time for maybe three more questions. Um, one from uh, Mark. What happens to couples who are forced to go back to pre-corona way of parenting because of resumption of normal working hours? Uh, that is for non-flexible employers. Yeah yet they had developed a new flexible way of helping each other out. Is there going to be conflict? Does one have to quit their jobs? Yes, I mean, really good question. Uh, I suspect that a lot of people who now they've realized that there is a better way of working, if they can't persuade their organization to at least go some of the way towards that, yeah, they'll start networking, they'll start looking for a new job, they'll start thinking about becoming self-employed, they'll start thinking about contract work. They will want to get the flexibility that they've experienced. I mean, obviously that's going to be amongst the ones who enjoyed the experience and who were successful at it and who want to go on. So I think that if organizations don't respond well to the couples who really clearly do want to work more flexibly, then they'll find they lose some of their best people. They'll find that those people just disappear and go off to do other work. Um, whether it's moving from one organization to another similar organization, or whether they're going for a completely different style of working. I mean, it's noticeable how many organizations have found ways of conducting their businesses wholly online. Um, those people are not going to change back very willingly because their customers, their clients have also discovered that it's much easier and more pleasant to talk to people online, not have to make journeys and so on and so on. So I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on organizations to adapt to the needs of both customers and employees who prefer the more flexible arrangements. Okay, all right. Uh, Isabella Camera, you have your hand up. Kindly ask your question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, just a comment. Um, some of us are old parents, so we are parents of adults who don't right. live at home, so we have emptiness. And we have lived a life where we have um, had each other, you know, spent, found ways of spending time together. But with COVID and uh, the, lock, uh, the partial lockdown, we found ourselves spending even more time together and finding things that we can do together, uh, trying to get interests with what, you know, getting interested in what the other person is more interested in. I'm not saying that there are times of that there are no times of boredom, they will be, but there are things that we are doing more together, and therefore it tells me that uh, come retirement, there will be some uh, Something that we have learned is the youth, our children, our daughters are all um, dating, and we have seen them date online very, you know, we asked them because we were concerned about with this, mm -hmm. and they're not seeing their, their, their boyfriends, what are they doing? And so they, they have devised ways. They they have um, house parties, they have uh, uh, Zoom meetings, and something interesting, they also have tea parties. They make tea, each one of them, or whatever it is they want <laughs> to drink. And they sit and they can talk while drinking and sharing those moments. You know, even their two daughters, even the, the four of them with, with the spouses, 
Um, and so uh, they are with their fiancés. And so uh, <laughs> what, what we find is, uh, is um, we're learning a lot. So even, even us, if we do have to go back to work, uh, we're not together, uh, Zoom will be the way of communication. No more WhatsApps or well, very few WhatsApps. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great comment. Um, you, you raise a very interesting point about, okay, you're not experiencing the pressure of looking after children, but you've changed your lifestyle a bit as a result of spending more time at home and more time with each other. I suspect you've probably slowed down a bit. You're perhaps enjoying each minute rather more than you perhaps used to. You're perhaps doing things that you didn't have time for before. Maybe you're reading more books, listening more to more music, spending more time conversing together. I think people have genuinely discovered that they like the lockdown more than they expected. You know, most people saw the negatives of it as it started, but people have begun to find positives. And I think that's going to have an influence on the way we develop into the future. People will enjoy each other's company in different ways. Uh, they will slow down a bit. They'll be, perhaps become a little less materialistic. Perhaps it'll be less about flashy cars and driving around, um, more about learning how to get the best of online communications and uh, each other's company. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Hart. I believe we have exhausted almost all the questions. <laughs> uh, <Okay. laughs> well, wait, there's one. Okay, we'll allow one last one from Ruth Kinyanji on the chat. Eh? What mm -hmm. is the future of dating <laughs> with lockdowns and zero distance? Well, I think we are going to see a great deal more online dating. I think that's. I think people have discovered a way to do it. When they discovered Zoom, when they really discovered video chat, they suddenly realized that it's possible to date people effectively online. Um, a lot of the problems about online dating disappear just because you've got a video feed. Um, and I think people are really enjoying it. Um, I don't know whether you see it, but the, um, the Guardian newspaper, for example, runs a blind date column, which just simply moved online. I mean, until the lockdown, these blind dates were real blind dates in pubs and restaurants. Now they're not, they're video calls. Enjoy going, on, going to the um, Guardian website and reading one or two of these columns because clearly they're good fun. So I think dating is probably going to get a lot easier, actually, post lockdown. Uh, people are going to spend more time online. They're going to feel less pressure to go and spend lots and lots of money in expensive restaurants. And they're going to get closer to one another emotionally, probably long before they physically meet. They'll still meet, of course, obviously. But I think they will get to know each other online a lot better. Okay. I will invite uh, President-elect, President Malaki. I think Malaki is offline. Hello? Can you? Okay. Um, yes, please go well, ahead. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Chris Hart. Uh, this session has been very informative uh, from the questions that you know the members have been asking and your how thoughtful you've uh, responded to them. It's just been quite intriguing. And I have to state that, you know, this is the first meeting where we almost got to the limit of not being able to admit anyone else to the, to the Zoom call. We got to 99. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's always great reading 
your articles and uh, watching you on TV. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank and, you. And it's been an enormous pleasure talking with you. And I've enjoyed the session enormously. And of course, I have to just do a quick advert that if any of you feel the need to talk to a counsellor anytime, well, then we'll meet online. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Chris Hart. Uh, what time is it over there? Oh, gosh, I have no idea. Uh, with me, it is 6 o'clock right now, okay. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. So right? I presume you're going, your binge is going on for a little bit longer, and so I'll just yes, quietly buy that. I wanted, I wanted to release you. Thank you so much.